Hello, everyone. It's my privilege to be with all of you, and a warm welcome to DBAS Dev Day. Uh, my name is Kamal Gupta. Hi, everybody. Let's please respect all speakers. Thank you. You guys are so kind. Thank you. All right, guys. Um, again, warm welcome for DBAS Dev Day. My name is Kamal Gupta. I am founder and CEO of Omnistrate. Uh, at Omnistrate, we help data companies to build their enterprise-grade uh, SaaS offering in no time. Uh, so I'd love to talk about more, you know, how uh, today in the next 25 minutes, I'd love to talk more about uh, what is DBS, DBS, sorry, DBAS and uh, why it matters. And how, uh, you know, some of the challenges in building the DBAS, how you can use some of the CNCF uh, ecosystem in building one. So what is DBAS? DBAS, DBAS is a, you know, is a cloud-based approach to build uh, essentially a cloud offering around the database management uh, to enable your users to access and use the database without worrying about the underlying details, right? You don't have to worry about the provisioning, infrastructure provisioning, the installation, or you know, uh, managing the infrastructure, and so on and so on. The key characteristics that you look at, like when you think about DBAS, is three things. One is your users should be able to access the database on demand. I mean, we started back in AWS. Um, I was one of the founding engineers there. Uh, that it used to take 15, 15 minutes to provision. Gone are those days. Now the expectation is to get, get it up and running under a minute. Uh, then, uh, you know, the, the second expectation is it has to be zero admin. Your customers don't have to worry about it. They want to focus on their application. They don't want to worry about, uh, you know, how the underlying details are managed, uh, you know, how infrastructure is provisioned, scaled, or upgraded. All of those things, they want to just, uh, you know, not worry about it. And third is the cloud native experience. I think it's a very important point to understand that, you know, when we think about providing the experience, they are looking for an experience where they, they can think about as a table as a service, as opposed to thinking about, hey, can you tell me how many CPUs, need, CPUs, in, CPUs you need, or the network, or the storage configuration, or memory configuration, and then have to you know, pick and choose everything. And then tomorrow, if they have to, uh, they have a, you know event going on, then they have to worry about each and every a small thing and, and, and uh, you know, scale things uh, themselves, which is basically pushing the problem to your customers as opposed to, you know, as a service provider, you should be able to encapsulate those things and, and make it seamless for your customers to not worry about those things. So why do we care? Well, as, as I just mentioned, right, uh, that your customers don't need to worry about provisioning. They don't need highly skilled operators to manage the databases. They don't need to worry about the making the trade-offs between performance, availability, durability, cost. And I think by doing so, uh, you know, DBAS is transforming the whole industry in how, or reimagining the whole database industry in how the databases are uh, managed in the cloud. So here is the, you know, a rough, Hello world architecture looks like. You know, your request comes in from the user, uh, you apply, Terraform apply, to do some information, infrastructure provisioning. Uh, you uh, then do some uh, installation of the respective database software, configure your, your, your database, and you return back, right? Is that it? Like, can we all go home and all, all we done? Anybody sees anything wrong with this? Of course, it's not that simple as you all know. Uh, you know, there are, uh, I'll cover the six broad challenges today, uh, but there are, are more, uh, essentially. Uh, so, uh, and, and I think the reason I chose these six, because they are commonly applicable across the array of the DBAS landscape. So I'll cover the first three because they are very correlated with each other together, and then I'll follow up with the other thing. So when we think about provisioning, uh, you know, first thing that comes to mind is the infrastructure provisioning. And you know, there are great tools like Terraform uh, that allows essentially to have a global state. And, and whenever you want to make a change, you can make an incremental change on top. 
But that works great on the static environments. As you, as you know, there, there's several challenges with that model. One is, how do we you know, keep it modular when you are at a dynamic environment? When, when you have a large number of users, how are you able to uh, uh, contain the reconciliation time, essentially? Uh, how are you able to essentially uh, deploy things in an atomic way and guarantee the atomicity? Uh, of it, and then you know there are other challenges like drift detection and collaboration challenges that comes in as as you scale uh, with Terraform. So those are all the things that to keep in mind when you think about building the or choosing the right tool for infrastructure management. Then <clears throat> the other thing to worry about is the customization. Uh, as we are building the DBAS, there are users with specific configuration. They have specific requirements. So you have to think about those requirements carefully. Uh, you have to think about the constraints. Uh, you know, for example, as a service provider, you may want to allow a given user to only have a maximum of 10 clusters, let's say, or other constraints that the product constraints that you want to put in. You have to worry about the underlying cloud limits uh, that uh, underlying cloud providers offers. Uh, you have to worry about uh, you know, the technical limitations of your own uh, you know, uh, underlying database itself. So all of those things have to be uh, thought through. Uh, the other thing that is very important is um, the orchestration. Uh, typically, you, you know, as you scale with a large number of users, you will not have one Kubernetes. You will have many Kubernetes clusters. So how do you orchestrate? How do you bin pack uh, uh, you know, ac across them? Uh, you need to have a flexibility uh, across uh, your uh, deployment models. Because as your business is growing, you, know, you may have di different infrastructure, like, let's say different networking types, you may have a public offering and a private offering. You may, uh, over time, may deploy in customer's account uh, versus just the hosted mode. You may, over time, uh, be offered in different cloud providers, offer different regions, may add different services on top. So all of those things, as your business is scaling, you have to think about uh, the implication of those. So when you think about designing these things, uh, you have to you know, cons consider those things in mind. And finally, I think I didn't touch on reliability, but very quickly, uh, it's important because at the end of the day, the core metadata, while you know, the, the database is doing its job, but the fact that you are storing the user information and where these states are stored in which Kubernetes, all of those things have to be stored durably. If you lose that, that's a big problem, essentially. Uh, to, for customers to have that, continue to have that seamless experience. So you have to, um, maintain that durability. Then we have scaling challenges, if that was not enough, right? Uh, you know, as you think about scaling, you go from uh, simple manual scaling to things like start and stop, to things like schedule based, to things like being able to auto scale, and then all, all the way auto scale down to zero. Right? And how do you go to this spectrum, and where do you want to fall in this spectrum, right? and, and what kind of offering you want to offer to your customers? Then you think about uh, the cost implication. If you don't have scale down implemented, that will be costly either to you, and you essentially will be costly, uh, you know, a cost that will be passed on to your customers as well. Uh, uh, and, and then this important aspect about the state, which is, <clears throat> let's say if you're a stateless system, it's pretty easy, right? Like, you get a machine, you get provision IP, you get uh, just the load balancer configuration, and you put those things together, get the health check up, okay, all good. But what happens when you have a stateful system? All of a sudden, this becomes uh, much more complicated. Uh, and like, for example, you have to think about when you're adding a new machine, do you have to do some rebalancing? What happens when you're doing the scaling? How does it interface with other operations that are happening in the fleet? Let's say you're running an upgrade during the same time. So would you allow that? And how does it interfere with that? Uh, and and uh, considering those things in mind. Um, then uh, when, how, which metric will you use, for example, to make the decision on when to, uh, when to up, uh, scale up or scale down? Uh, are you going to use CPU, memory, combination of that? Like, how do you figure that out? So all of those things have to be uh, carefully considered. And finally, uh, I'll touch quickly on the patching challenges, some of the patching challenges. Uh, one is the speed, of course. You know, in the, you, there's a security compliance requirements. You want to get things out very quickly. There's also the user, ex your customer's expectations that features needs to be out. You can't wait in this era for six months to 
the changes to be out. So thing, you know, you need something that can out in days, uh, essentially, and, and roll it out to the large fleet, essentially. So how do you achieve that? Um, scale is important because uh, you know you have your software images, you have infrastructure, you have cloud provider itself is making the infrastructure changes. So how do you do all those changes across array of customers that you have uh, and, and roll out safely? And, and coming back to the safely, uh, safe point, the, the reliability, you need uh, you know, several prevention and mitigation mechanisms. Because as we all know, right, in the software industry, things do go wrong. And so we need to make sure that we have a proper testing mechanisms, we have proper canneries uh, in production uh, to catch, catch things early, we have things uh, to um, uh, you know, prevent uh, from happening uh, at, the, at the first place by, uh, you know, uh, if let's say an, an issue happens in production, you want to make sure that you have some sort of mitigation mechanism with pause and, and resume kind of mechanism. Uh, and uh, you know, have a proper uh, rollout philosophy, right? Like things like uh, start, uh, start slow and then accelerate. Or, or people follow some S-curve uh, strategies as well where they uh, you know, start uh, slow, then they accelerate, and they slow down for large customers or in large regions. And so some sort of strategy that works for your uh, tried and tested in, the, in, the, in, in your uh, environment uh, has to be thought through. So all, you know, all those challenges uh, from provisioning, scaling, and patching have to come together. And so that's a lot, right? So how can we achieve some of those uh, uh, with uh, the CNCF ecosystem? So first thing is Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes is a great starting point. Uh, it's a, it offers right off the get-go uh, a, a lot of functionality uh, to uh, basically not to reinvent the wheel, essentially. Right? And you can just leverage and build on top of it. Then on Cherry on Cake is the Kubernetes operators. Provides an excellent framework to uh, you know, build your own custom resources and your custom control plane logic uh, that uh, essentially allow you to uh, think about uh, your uh, like defining your control plane logic right in there. Uh, and so the way uh, you know, typically it works is uh, you have a state in Kubernetes and you have a desired state that you want, the change that you want. It looks at the diff, essentially it applies uh, that uh, act on that diff uh, and, and make those changes happen. Uh, and that's the core framework that you can use essentially as a building block on which you can implement some of the challenges I mentioned earlier. But there are some challenges with, even with the Kubernetes operators. Uh, you know, they are limited to one Kubernetes. As you will scale, you will definitely be spanning across Kubernetes. So how do you deal with that? Uh, you will have challenges with respect to coupling. So you have to be very careful in designing. You don't mix your control plane and data plane logic uh, too much. And, and how do you have proper testing in place uh, to address, uh, to avoid cascading failures in the future? Uh, you need to think about the service evolution. Um, because if the change itself requires the operator deployment itself, that can slow down uh, the, the changes in production. You know, think about uh, you know, which, how do you integrate operators with infrastructure management. Uh, and some effort has to be put on the, you know, on the maintenance, on getting the in, inbuilt visibility, like in, sorry, uh, extending the Kubernetes operator to have the internal visibility and some controls. You can use annotations, for example, to uh, have been, build some controls uh, and uh, being able to implement the pause and stop again that, that I mentioned earlier in case things go wrong. So here is uh, you know uh, some suggestion on top of the Kubernetes that one can think about. So you can use Kubernetes operator to essentially use things like crossplane or config con uh, connector to do the infrastructure provisioning. Then you can have a talk to the scheduler uh, to which, uh, and rely upon the autoscaler to do some of the scaling efforts. And, you know, and uh, use uh, uh, some sort of a workflow system on top of this to orchestrate uh, across these Kubernetes clusters, essentially. And, and offer that as a, you know, uh, as a service to, to, to your customers. All right, so next challenge is the monitoring. Uh, when we're thinking about high availability, 
there are several failures that we have to consider. It's just not sufficient to just, in the, especially in the stateful system, to just consider the process failures and the machine failures. That's not going to give you the desired SLA, especially if you're shooting for 3.9s or 4.9 SLA. So you have to think about far more beyond that, and, and you have to think about what happens if there's a network partition, where your customers cannot reach you, and you, everything behind the scenes may be actually okay. So how do you handle that? So maybe we need uh, some sort of an external mechanism to constantly ping the database to make sure that the, it's reachable. Uh, you need to handle the gray storage nodes, like the fluctuating storage nodes or uh, the storage nodes going in read-only mode, and how do you detect those uh, you know, failure uh, or failed infrastructure and replace those uh, in, in a timely manner. You have to worry about the hung processes. Databases can have dead latches, uh, and they can get stuck. So even though uh, everything may look that the machine is up and the processes seems to be running, in the sense that you, you can uh, see the process is live, but you may not be making any progress. So how do you detect that? Right? Uh, things like correlated failures. Depending upon if you have a, you know, a horizontal scaled out system and you have some sort of requirements of two out of three quorums or four out of six quorums, whatever you guys have, um, uh, you have to think about uh, what's the implication if multiple machine failures and how do you place those multiple machines across different zonal endpoints? Then you have to think about uh, the AZ, the whole data center failures. You know, we, we at Confluent, I uh, was running the Kafka engineering, we thought uh, prematurely that uh, it's not something that is, you know, that common. Uh, apparently we had at, at scale, there are a lot, you know, you, it almost happens uh, every, every month. Uh, and uh, one of the cloud providers or, or something is going wrong. And so how do you deal with the data center failures where, and especially any, every time it will happen, if you don't handle it properly, it can cause uh, a huge uh, uh, in outage. So we did a lot of work to, uh, at Confluent, but that's something that you have to think about for your technology, how to handle that. So here are some suggestions uh, to use uh, uh, some of the CNCF uh, tech on top. So the Pixie and the Inspector are more native tools, which uses uh, eBPF to, uh, uh, to gather some observability, but then you can also use uh, more cross-platform uh, tech uh, like uh, NetData and uh, Hubble and Sentry. Uh, the, the goal here is to eventually collect this metrics through Vector, eventually send it to one of the, you know, sync. Uh, it could be Prometheus, it could be Datadog, or whatever your uh, choice uh, of observability tool, and then define alerts on top of it. So some sort of, a, uh, a, you know, infrastructure is needed. And as I mentioned, you know, earlier, you know, it's, you have to think about handling the, uh, the in-process, uh, hand, handling of the failures, but you also have to worry about the network partitions. So that's why both uh, sorts of monitoring and, and collecting all those events and sending those events through uh, some sort of an aggregation uh, mechanism like vector uh, and, and, and defining alerts on top uh, you know, could be one of the mechanisms that you guys can think about. Moving on, uh, one of the things, <laughs> it's important, <laughs> okay, it's great, we got the you know, uh, amazing uh, DBAS, which is, we can provision, uh, scale, and uh, patch, and monitor, but we have to bill. <laughs> we have to charge our customers, and, and how do you do that, and what is the infrastructure for that, all right? And so some of the problems that you have to solve uh, there is, first of all, gathering the usage, uh, you know, what, uh, what kind of uh, in the infrastructure usage, or whatever the metric you're using uh, to define, calculate your internal cost, uh, and, and estimate your price for the customers, um, then you, you need to collect that, uh, those things. You have to aggregate, uh, because usually these are sample data points in terms of time, so you have to aggregate over time. And then you have to uh, you know, do the invoicing. Uh, many times, bigger customers will also have a custom pricing, so you have to implement that. Uh, you can handhold it initially, uh, you know, but as you grow, your business will grow. That's something that it cannot be hand, uh, managed uh, in, in, you know, uh, in, in, in manually. It has to be something that is automated. And then one of the important channels is, you know, one, one is a direct channel where customers can come in and pay as you go. They can swipe in the credit card and, and things. But then you have to also important to consider as a marketplace integration. This is a huge revenue driver. Uh, for uh, uh, you know, DBAS companies uh, to how to integrate with AWS, GCP, and Azure, their marketplace, so you can co-sell with them and, uh, uh, and drive that uh, uh, you know, uh, 
um, marketing channel, but it's also something that requires uh, proper integration. It's not something, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a technology problem where you have to integrate with them. And there are many providers, by the way, which uh, solve that, like Tackle and Plazar and uh, others who, who address this problem. And finally, you have to worry about the, the compliance uh, because of the financial uh, controls that you need to enable on top of it. So here is uh, some, uh, again, reference architecture that you can use. Uh, basically, the metrics that we collected in the, in the last, in the monitoring si side, you can also, similarly, you can collect the usage metrics, and you can send it to a uh, billing aggregation job, uh, which can be a, some sort of a, a Lambda function, uh, and uh, store that usage metric after aggregating back to S3, uh, and then you can uh, further apply the, I can't even read. On the other side, what is it? Um, some sort of, yeah, so basically uh, use that data, uh, the final output to do, generate the invoicing uh, and send it back to your users. Um, and finally, uh, uh, this all is great, uh, but uh, building DBAS is not over yet. Uh, you have to worry about the experience, as we talked about earlier. Uh, and let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so you have to worry about uh, the UI, CLI, and API. Those are basic experiences. But then you have to also, some customers prefer to integrate with Terraform. So you may have to provide that Terraform integration where they ha might have existing Terraform where they are provisioning their, their infrastructure, and they can call uh, your uh, you know, uh, uh, APIs, Terraform APIs, to invoke and, and provision their stack. Uh, you have to worry about user management uh, and how they are going to manage their keys, how they're going to manage uh, their access control, how uh, they're going to manage their organization and, and uh, you know, uh, define groups within their organization. Uh, you have to worry about observability. How do you provide them some sort of a basic, you know, when we talk about observability, it's like metrics, logging, events, you know, how do you provide those kind of uh, information to your customers, whatever you feel appropriate. Um, then finally, compliance. Right? It's important to, uh, as a DBAS, that, you, uh, that uh, some sort of compliance, uh, SOC 2 is, uh, is there, but then in Europe, uh, you go to ISO 27001. So those, those things are, uh, are required. Uh, and so here are some uh, tools you can use, uh, like uh, Key Clock for identity and access management, and then uh, Open Policy Agent for RBAC, uh, and those tools you can use to, uh, you know, extend uh, the, from the user database uh, that I mentioned earlier that you can that you have created. You can integrate with those uh, and uh, provide uh, API gateway with Glue Edge and uh, uh, identity and RBAC with Key Clock and Open Open Policy. So here is a, a quick demo, by the way, on uh, we try to at Omnistrate help uh, streamline a lot of this. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly play that uh, and then wrap it up. Can I? OK, sounds good. I'll, I'll just wrap it up. I'll share the demo link, and then we have it. Uh, All right, so key takeaways. Um, well, first, Kubernetes is a foundation. I think that should be pretty obvious. Uh, second, we talked about a bunch of uh, CNCF uh, technologies from Prometheus to Grafana to Docker, Envoy, Vector. And you can use all of those uh, things to solve array of the problems uh, or some of the common problems that we touched upon today. Uh, third, it's important to, one of the things I want you guys to take away is that design is important that to not think about too short term. Because this uh, problem of the DBAS is, uh, as your business will scale, if you're not careful, you will end up with a spaghetti of the code, essentially, and it will be very hard. Nobody will want to touch that code, and it will become really hard to manage. And so it's very important to consider uh, you know, how your business will evolve in the future and, and consider two-way door decisions rather than one-way door decisions, and have that flexibility built in from the day one. Uh, and finally, I would say is, you know, don't underestimate the day two operation side of the house. Uh, when we think about DBAS, we often emphasize a lot on the day one experience, which is like, how do we get the beautiful experience for our customers, but not worry about things like upgrades and, and then how the evolution will happen and things like that. So uh, automating those things uh, at scale is, is uh, paramount. 
Uh, and that will define essentially the experience for your customers as well. Think about it, right? When we are thinking about upgrades, uh, the customers will want to get the latest and greatest very quickly. So if you haven't automated it properly, and it, it takes months or, or quarters, then it becomes really, really hard. Well, thank you so much. And I have a link here if anybody was interested in watching that. Thank you.